respected doctors very good evening to you all it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of hipka laboratories limited for a very interesting webinar on a topic which is very different that is arteries unclogged for this webinar we have top cardiologists of the country as a faculty today's meeting will be moderated by dr professor anjanlal datta sir and the speakers are dr gurpreet wander sir and dr tiny nair sir it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce today's moderator dr anjanal datta sir to you dr anjanal datta sir is a working as a cardiologist at tearless hospital and ekra research center at kolkata sir is a past president of cardiological society of india sir has published more than 100 research papers and sir is a regular invited at the faculty national and international conferences then it gives me pleasure to welcome and introduce our speakers and dr our first speaker is dr gurpreet wander sir sir is a professor of cardiology at dayanand medical college and hospital ludhiana and there are different publications sir has published almost 188 papers 90 of them in foreign journals of repute like the lancet nature genetics jack agc and heart journal And there are different awards like uh, there was the president of association of physicians of india for 2016 17 then president of the hypertension society of india for 2012 13 sir is awarded dr b c roy national award for the year 2006 and sir is editor of cardiology section of the api textbook of medicine india and sir will be speaking on a topic river exaban in thromboprophylaxis af and vte welcome to you sir then we have dr tiny nair sir sir is a founder and head of department of cardiology prs hospital trivandrum in kerala sir has the best doctor award by the government of kerala which was bestowed upon him in year 2006 and most inspiring doctor of india award by economic times in 2019 sir is an editorial board of hypertension journal indian heart journal Kerala Heart Journal, European Journal of Heart Failure, and sir has authored many books, like five books sir has authored, and latest one is Magic of Indian Medicine. There are forty-four publications and three national orations. Sir is a top writer, that is a Quora blog he writes, and TEDx talk speaker also, and sir will be speaking on a topic, River Exaban in Vascular Protection. welcome to you also sir with this small introduction i hand over the session to our moderator sir dr anjan lal datta over to you sir good evening everybody and thanks to ipka for organizing a meeting of a very important and topical subject like uh, unclogging coronary arteries or unclogging arteries for that matter we have with us we are proud to have with us two very important persons delivering lectures on this subject one is dr g s wonder one of the most important or the one of the pioneers of cardiology in india who has established cardiology in the northern part of india so to say and he is a very important person in the research and teaching arena and throughout his entire career of 30 years of teaching and research we are proud to have him here as one of the speakers tiny nair dr tiny nair is i won't say an emerging talent he is already an established talent but for me or to me it appears to be he is still emerging and is for him the sky is the limit and he is a very brilliant student and a very dedicated student of cardiology and an excellent speaker so without wasting further time let me have the pleasure of inviting dr wonder to talk on thromboprophylaxis with rivaroxaban in af and vt dr gurpit singh wonder please thank you uh, dr anjan lal datta for this kind introduction and uh, thanks to ipka and pleasure to be uh, participating in this uh, uh, webinar 
today on uh, use of uh, the newer oral anticoagulant, actually uh, the DOAX uh, Rivaroxaban, which is in focus today. And I will be talking on uh, the indication actually in patients with um, uh, atrial fibrillation and in patients with uh, venous uh, thromboembolism. And then uh, Dr. Tiny Nair, a good friend of mine, is going to tell you about the vasculoprotective role of these um, agents. I am actually going to take you through the newer oral anticoagulants in its uh, full perspective because the newer oral anticoagulants are actually new as the name implies and uh, there are significant uh, uh, actually issues uh, and advantages with this new class of agents. Luckily, there are four agents in the newer oral anticoagulants, the DOAX, and three of them are available in our country. So you can imagine that we have actually access to some of the latest uh, drugs that are available. Uh, and the two major indications for the use of these agents are in patients with non, um, uh, so to say, mitral stenosis, uh, valvular uh, non-valvular uh, um, atrial fibrillation and in prophylaxis and treatment of venous thromboembolism, DVT and in pulmonary embolism. Uh, you will actually all uh, be familiar with this figure that we have an intrinsic pathway for coagulation and we have an extrinsic pathway which is dependent on the tissue factor and both these converge on the factor 10 uh, and that's why we have these factor 10A inhibitors. We have the parenteral as well as the oral ones, which we will be discussing today. Uh, prothrombin is converted to thrombin and factor 10 has effects on thrombin and which then results in the fibrin clot. So actually we are actually looking at agents which affect the factor 2 and agents that affect the factor 10. And these are the newer oral anticoagulants. Atrial fibrillation, you know, is one of the commonest arrhythmias uh, that we deal with in cardiology patients. And uh, it uh, is not an innocuous rhythm abnormality, although lone atrial fibrillation is a condition when it is, it is not related to any underlying heart disease, but mostly it is based upon some underlying heart disease. And just the presence of atrial fibrillation itself increasing increases the risk of death by two times. It increases the risk of embolic strokes, the incidence of which is 5% per year. Heart failure is increased. Of course, these patients are symptomatic and they get uh, hospitalized very frequently. So atrial fibrillation is not an innocuous arrhythmia and it is not even infrequent because 1% of the population less than 60 years and almost 7 to 8 percent of the population more than 80 years. So it's an arrhythmia which occurs in elderly population because coronary artery disease, hypertension, all the etiological factors are actually in the elderly population. Although the commonest cause of atrial fibrillation in the younger individuals in our country is of course rheumatic heart disease. One subset of patients of renal failure, actually, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation is much higher and these agents have issues in terms of their usage. And so the prevalence in these patients is about 15% and there we need to be a little bit uh, conversant with the dosages of these neural anticoagulants that we use. So essentially in patients of atrial fibrillation, what do we do actually? There are two important things that we have to manage prevention of stroke because we know in the left atrial appendage, the thrombus forms and then it gets embolized. It can cause cerebral strokes. It can cause embolic phenomenon to any part of the body for that matter. The second important is the rhythm control that we have to do. It could be a rhythm control or rate control. And there, there is a lot of controversy whether rhythm control is better than the rate control. In fact, trials show that there isn't much to gain by rhythm control. Of course, our atrial fibrillation ablation is actually a very important mode of therapy, especially in patients with atrial flutter, intermittent AF, but that's for another day. Let's focus on the stroke management, which is the major risk of atrial fibrillation that we have. And it is this scoring system which tells us 
it is not just the presence of atrial fibrillation but it is these risk factors those people who are harboring these risk factors they need to be anticoagulated so if someone has heart failure hypertension diabetes more elderly people have more risk of strokes with atrial fibrillation those who've had strokes earlier or uh, females of course have higher risk so you can have a maximum score of 9 and you can see the incidence of ischemic stroke as the chad vesk score goes up from 0 to 1 it doesn't jump that much from 1 to 2 it really jumps to 2.2% per year and then of course it escalates as the number of risk factors that i enumerated to you hypertension diabetes elderly stroke all these things make a difference it's not only the risk of stroke that you have to keep in mind with atrial fibrillation but these people when we use oral the conventional vitamin k anticoagulants actually there is a risk of bleeding also because the therapeutic window of oral anticoagulants the vitamin k antagonists the warfarin and acinocoumaral the acitrom is very little and so the has blood score has to be the physicians have to be familiar this with this depending upon hypertension stroke renal liver disease bleeding tendencies elderly labile and inrs some drugs like aspirin nsaids so the risk of bleeding is dependent upon these factors and i urge upon anyone wanting to use oral anticoagulants should be familiar with the chad vesk score and the bleeding risk which is by the has blood score initially actually many years about 15 20 years back what, there was a debate and lot of these very important multicentric large trials showed that there is a two third reduction in strokes when we used warfarin in our patients and there was 30 days stroke mortality was significantly reduced some people felt that actually a sub optimal anticoagulation with inrs of less than 2 with aspirin could be as good as adequate dose uh, warfarin but it has been seen that the combination th therapy gives no added advantage over adjusted dose adequate dose warfarin whether someone had thromboembolism previously or not we know someone who had a thromboembolism earlier is at a greater risk of thromboembolic episodes and they are by the chart vesk score at a higher risk of having strokes uh, this is a very important slide actually which i like to show to my residents very frequently because in the dotted line you can see the risk of intracranial hemorrhage and in this continuous line you can see the risk of thromboembolism in patients with atrial fibrillation and see the balance is between 2 to 3 so 65 to 70% of the times that you do inrs of your patient it should be between 2 to 3 once it goes up beyond 3 the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage just escalates look at the way it does and once the inr is less than 2 you hardly give any benefit to your patients so don't be complacent with inrs of 1.3 1.7 try to achieve maximum readings in this and this is actually the most important slide in terms of how we should be anticoagulating our patients whenever we use warfarin or whether we are using acinocoumaral because the therapeutic window of these drugs is much less and there are other issues with warfarin that there are drug interactions there is diet and warfarin interaction also we know the intracerebral hemorrhage risk is about 0.3% per year and this risk is more in people who have inrs beyond 3 as i said elderly where we have to be more careful than people who had previous strokes but noex actually reduce this risk of intracerebral hemorrhage which is the most dreaded complication of use of warfarin of course warfarin reduces the incidence of strokes by 3 to 4 times and all patients with non valvular atrial fibrillation who have a chad vesk score of 2 or more should be on oral anticoagulants in fact patients with mitral stenosis they have four to five times greater risk of embolic strokes than patients with non valvular atrial fibrillation and they need even to a more stronger extent they need to be anticoagulated
The first newer oral anticoagulant which came actually to be used is dabigatron. And this is the dosages. It's a twice a day drug. It is a pro drug. Patients of ve uh, uh, venous thromboembolism, atrial fibrillation, a dose of 150 milligrams twice a day is used. Whereas in DVT prophylaxis, we know after hip surgery, we need to use for four weeks. And after knee surgery, we use, need to use for 10 weeks. One of the major side effects is dyspepsia and GI uh, reflux. The second agent, which is actually the agent we are discussing today, is uh, river oxaben, which is the second agent actually to have been um, made available to us in terms of usage in patients with atrial fibrillation and venous thromboembolism. And the dosage actually for prevention of venous thromboembolism is 10 milligrams daily. Patients who have had VTE, you use 15 milligrams twice a day for one week and then 20 milligrams daily. Patients of atrial fibrillation, now advantage of river oxaban is it's a once a day drug. The third agent is epixaban, which has become more recently available. It's again a twice a day drug. The dosage is five milligrams twice a day in patients who have normal creatinine clearance. Whereas if two of these three risk factors, age more than 80, weight less than 60, creatinine more than 1.5, then you have to half the dose in these people. Uh, well, we all know the oral anticoagulants actually became available to us in 1940s and these agents actually have now become available in the last 10 to 15 years. So we have all the senior cardiologists like Dr. Anjanlal Datta and all of us actually have been uh, using warfarin and acinocumarol for uh, decades. And now we have these newer agents which reduce the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. And so we are more actually uh, using more and more of these agents. Well, these are the four agents, dabigatron, apixaban, edoxaban, and rivaroxaban. And one very important thing is rivaroxaban has to be given with food because almost 35 to 40 percent increased absorption is there when you use rivaroxaban uh, with food. The side effects uh, are not uh, too many, but important thing is these newer oral anticoagulants should not be given to breastfeeding women, to people with uh, uh, creatinine clearances of less than 30 ml and patients with hepatic impairment. One of the biggest fear actually we have is that with vitamin K antagonists, we can use actually protamine, we can use plasma and we can neutralize these uh, if there is a bleed. But the um, antidotes actually to these agents, idarucizumab is an antidote for dabigatron and for the factor 10A, uh, we have the adenexet. These are actually expensive, not yet available in our country. So this is one of the reason for fear in the minds of people. These are the three large trials done with the three agents, dabigatron, rivaroxaban, apixaban. All three trials, more than 15,000 patients. All three trials reduced major bleeding in terms of efficacy. They were equal or better than warfarin. And these three trials, the RELY, the Rocket AF, and the Aristotle trial have actually established the newer oral anticoagulants in terms of uh, drugs of choice in patients with atrial fibrillation today because they significantly actually reduce the risk of uh, stroke in these people and also the intracerebral hem hemorrhages are more. The ROCKET AF trial is the one with rivaroxaban, large trial, 14,000 patients, significant reduction actually in intracerebral hemorrhage and equally effective in terms of reduction of thrombotic uh, strokes. And so we concluded that these agents are to be preferred. And so the guidelines have also actually shifted and they are now advocating the NOx over and in preference to the warfarin. Now, warfarin is still preferred in today's world in patients we are already who are on warfarin and they are comfortable with it. Patients of mitral stenosis, these drugs have not been tested. So the newer oral anticoagulants cannot be used in patients with mitral stenosis. Patients with severe uh, CKD, as I shared with you, of course, they are more expensive. They are recent drugs, although rivaroxaban has now become significantly cost effective. And people who are on enzyme inducing anti epileptics of NOx have drug interactions. So we don't use them in prosthetic heart valves. We don't use them in end stage renal disease. Pregnant women, 
in antiphospholipid antibodies and mitral stenosis. So it is only in non-valvular atrial fibrillation, which is not due to one of these causes that these agents are to be used. Of course, in that situation, the NOx are preferred over vitamin K antagonists because of their safety profile. And if you look at the SPAF guidelines, someone more than 65 use oral anticoagulants, prefer NOx. One of these, as I showed you the Chad Vesk score, that is how you will prefer these. And so today these three agents are actually preferred as the agents of choice over warfarin because of their safety profile. Of course, we have actually uh, patients who cannot tolerate oral anticoagulants in whom they are contraindicated. Left atrial appendage occlusion devices are now available in our country also. They are FDA approved, they are expensive. People who cannot be provided with oral anticoagulants, this is another choice that you have. The second important indication that I'm going to dwell upon in the next couple of minutes is uh, in uh, deep vein thrombosis of the legs, the venous thromboembolism, and we know the dreaded complication of that is pulmonary thromboembolism. So that is the second important indication of this particular condition. Uh, very important uh, information. Uh, always actually when you have a patient of DVT, look at whether it is provoked or whether it is non-provoked. Because if it is provoked by surgery, its recurrence risk in the first year is only 1%. But if it is actually unprovoked, the recurrence risk is 10%. And if it is a second episode, it is 15%. So surgical risk is less, non-surgical provoked. So patients with unprovoked VT will require a long-term uh, anticoagulation rather than provoked where they will require only for a couple of uh, months, which is on an average three to six months. The bleeding risk, of course, as I said in the beginning, is the second factor you have to keep in mind in terms of how anticoagulation is used. And it is these Einstein DVT, Einstein pulmonary embolism, and Einstein extension trials in which rivaroxaban was used in a dosage of 20 milligram once dose daily and was compared with placebo and was found to be more effective and more safe than the conventional uh, oral anticoagulants. Now, if you have a patient who is on vitamin K antagonist and you want to switch over, switching actually you should start uh, the newer oral anticoagulant and start it only when the INR comes below 2. So you might stop it because we know the onset and offset of action of vitamin K antagonists is slow. And only when the INR drops to less than 2, you have to start NOx. Do not start at the same time while patient is on uh, vitamin K antagonists. And if somebody is on NOx and you are shifting on, then you start vitamin K antagonists along with NOx. Continue that when the INR goes to more to actually uh, less than two, then only you actually, uh, to more than two, then you withdraw the uh, NOAC so that the risk of thromboembolic episode does not occur when you are using. This is the second important issue that you have to keep in mind. Creatinine clearance is an important factor because you have to reduce the dosage in patients with reduced uh, creatinine clearance. And these are the usual dosages with these agents that we use. Uh, I think I'll uh, skip a couple of these slides. And so the DCGI has now approved river oxaban tablets in a dose of 10 milligrams daily for prevention of venous thromboembolism. The dosage for patients with venous thromboembolism and atrial fibrillation is 20 milligrams, but you will use 15 milligrams in those who have actually creatinine clearance of less than 50. This is something uh, my friend Tiny Nair is going to share with you. Uh, so friends, I would like to end here. We have three newer oral anticoagulants which are available in India. Main indications in terms of besides the, vas the vasculoprotective effect with Dr. Tiny Nair is going to share is non-valvular atrial fibrillation, prevention of venous thromboembolism, treatment of venous thromboembolism and pulmonary embolism. The safety over warfarin is proven in multiple large clinical trials in the American, European, Guidelines today actually suggest that these agents are to be preferred over warfarin. All of us actually should become familiar with their use. There isn't much to choose to them with between them, but you should preferably become familiar with one of those and then give the benefit to your patients. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Wonder, for your excellent deliberations, giving very important insights into the changing scenario of indications of uh, NOACs, the changing scenario in terms of uh, indications of its use in uh, renal insufficiency in dose, and particularly indications. You have talked about non-valvular atrial fibrillation. The non-valvular atrial fibrillation definition is getting changed. We'll discuss about that. And uh, of course, your uh, VT is already covered by you. Now the, we are now changing over to the arteries from vein to arteries. And to talk on this subject, we have Dr. Tiny Nair with us. So he has already been introduced. So Dr. Nair, please. Thank you, Dr. Ranjan Lalzata. And uh, thanks, uh, Wonder Sir, for that uh, extensive and excellent coverage of uh, uh, the new topic of Rivaroxaban. Uh, give me a moment by the time I share my screen. My screen is visible and am I audible? Yeah, you are both, your and your screen are visible. Thank you. So is that, that is, your uh, skin? So yeah, that is Banco Santander. Banco Santander is uh, one of the leading financial institutes in Spain. Uh, now Santander uh, joined up, signed up with the Spanish government and they decided to do a unique study involving 4,000 of their employees. It's a bank. So they, they decided that they will submit their employees for a good health trial. And that trial is called Project PESA. You might have heard about MESA and CESA, which basically are uh, studies of uh, subclinical atherosclerosis running in US. So they collaborated with US and Dr. Valentine Fuster was contacted to do the PESA trial, PESA trial, P-E-S-A, progression of early subclinical atherosclerosis in uh, Spain with the center at Madrid. Now, uh, uh, that is how this study went. It started in 2010 and went up to 2019. But let us uh, forget the complexities but, and look simply at how it happened. It's extremely interesting. The PISA trial had uh, the employees of State Bank of Madrid, the Banco Santander. The number of people who joined were 4,184. Now, these people were aged between 40 and 54, because at 55, they retired from the bank. So 40 to 54 year old, they were asymptomatic. They did not have any disease, no past history of cardiovascular disease. And they, so apparently they're healthy, like you and me, right? And they had some risk factors, but they're healthy. And they were checked for, by vascular ultrasound and non-contrast CT to look for vascular atherosclerosis. Basically they were looking at subclinical atherosclerosis. So the person is fine and they just looked at their entire body, whether they had any beginning of atherosclerosis. And they were followed up from 2010 till 2019. And in patients in whom they found out that there was atherosclerosis, accidental detection, subclinical atherosclerosis, they did an MRI and an FDG PET to look at the activity of the atherosclerotic plaque, right? And the pictures, the, uh, the trial made on to the center page of JACC 2019. And there is a central illustration that came in uh, JACC 2019. And look at that picture. What you see on the left on top is the atherosclerosis prevalence. So asymptomatic persons, they were healthy bank workers, no issues at all. Patients with cardiac disease excluded. And you see that 53% had a cerebrovascular atherosclerosis. 55% thoracoabdominal atherosclerosis. 73% femoropopliteal atherosclerosis. Okay, so you might say, okay, right. They have a, atherosclerosis is an age dependent process, right? So my arteries are not healthy as I was in the twenties or thirties or forties, right? So what is the fun in it? So they did, as we said, a FDG, uh, a PET FDG. And surprisingly, they found that the significant number has features of inflammation. So we know that inflammation is something that causes the plaque to rupture, right? So you see about 15% of cerebral, 19% of thoracic abdominal, 25% of peripheral vascular had inflammation in the plaque by PET FDG. So what are we talking about? A lot of asymptomatic people, you and me, we might have some atherosclerosis and more importantly, might even have plaque inflammation. Uh, let us now uh, go to another trial that came in 2019 
the Euclid trial. Now, the Euclid trial is a trial of polyvascular disease. So you see, there are vessel territories, right? You have cerebral vessels, you have uh, cardiac vessels, coronaries, you have got peripheral vessels. So polyvascular disease, and what exactly is the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events? Because we saw asymptomatic people walking around healthy bank staff has got a, a polyvascular disease. Okay, now very interestingly, uh, uh, the Euclid had 13,885 patients, and it turned out that 20% had peripheral arterial disease. 30% had either CAD with PAD or CVD with PAD. And about 10% had all three territories, CVD, CAD, and PAD. Sorry for the spelling mistake there. CAD, CVD, and PAD. So 10% had polyvascular disease involving the brain, involving the heart, and the peripheral vascular system. Okay, now when they followed them up, what they found was extremely surprising. The three-year follow-up and look at the primary efficacy endpoint. The primary endpoint was stroke, MI, and death. And they did find that at the bottom was those who had a single territory defect, like a PAD. In between the green and the orange are people who had two territory disease. And the worst was those on top, marked by the arrow, who had polyvascular disease involving all three, peripheral vascular, coronary and cerebral, right? And that is death, MI and stroke. Not just that, they looked into cardiovascular death, same, same. They looked into myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, same, same. Polyvascular disease involving all three territories, for example, had the worst outcome. More territories, more bad, bad was the outcome, right? And of course, what were they looking at? Even individual cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, every category showed that as the territories of involved vascular segments increase, the outcome worsens. And like we said, many of them might have undetected inflammation underlying. So this is a very interesting picture that the Euclid trial group brought out. They said that if you have cerebral, if you have coronary, and if you have peripheral vascular disease, you get a chart like this, right? So you see the coronary artery disease, Coronary artery disease as diagnosed by stable angina, unstable angina, MI, or prior, prior coronary vascularization has 50% chance. You see the green and red overlaps of having an intermittent claudication, ABI of less than 0.9, or a prior low, lower limb revascularization showing that there is peripheral arterial disease. And over 30%, they are likely to have cerebral vascular disease. So the relationship is pretty, pretty complex. Now, with that background, pause for a moment. And look at our patients. Right. This is one of our patients, uh, 56 years, diabetic, hypertensive, smoker, multiple risk factors. He decided one day, he's, he doesn't go for much walking and he's kind of uh, quiet, okay. And he uh, one day decided to have at age 56 insurance policy, so insurance people send him for a uh, uh, treadmill exercise test. Routine insurance, ECG was kind of some vague STT changes, so the insurance said, have a treadmill exercise test done. So this is kind of sinus tachycardia, my minimalist shift baseline ECG. And when we did the treadmill exercise test, he had some mild discomfort on, on peak exercise. This had happened about three and a half, four years back. Uh, we found significant ST depression in lateral leads, ST elevation in AVR, showing that there is significant uh, uh, ischemia of the myocardium, right? So obviously we have advised that recovery. We said you come for a coronary angiogram. And he was lost to follow up, never turned up. Okay. About three years later, he came back with severe claudication. And that's the time when he said, okay, I'm ready for everything. And this is coronary angiogram. You can see diffusely diseased LED. Look at that, totally occluded circumflex. Look at that, diffuse disease of RCA. And look at that, very bad peripheral artery. That is the knee joint, right? That's the knee. And you can see not just that, uh, the, the, beyond the knee, there was hardly any uh, vessels filling up and you can see a lot of thrombus in the, in the peripheral artery. So diffuse polyvascular disease. And this is exactly we, what we are talking about. Now, polyvascular disease, if we are talking about vascular protection, what do we do? Okay, right. First thing is we consider statins. Lipid lowering, and that is the, the, the pillar on which the entire uh, our science of uh, polyvascular disease treatment stands. Lipid lowering, we control blood pressure very well, and we know that RAS inhibitors, uh, of course, CCBs and diuretics, if they, they are complementary, uh, tends to reduce blood pressure well and reduce progression of the disease. Blood sugar control, 
Many of them are diabetic, and we need to have a good control of blood sugar, especially the new SGLT inhibitors are vascular protective. And of course, antithrombotics, dual antiplatelets are the norm, aspirin and DAPT. Now, if we look into that aspect of antithrombotic therapy, we ask just one question. Is there a scope for improvement of this current antithrombotic protocol and benefit in patients who have kind of polyvascular disease and a progressive high chance of cardiovascular event? Okay, we all know that uh, if we look at the uh, uh, antiplatelet trials, in, in uh, for example, chronic stable angina, we had the uh, Cherisma trial, which had uh, shown that aspirin uh, uh, and placebo versus aspirin and clopidogrel was a little bit better in event prevention. And we had the Pegasus trial, which showed that uh, 60 milligram DID of ticagrelor uh, with aspirin, 175 milligrams, but better than aspirin in the long run beyond a one year time in prevention of uh, cardiac events. And we had the Vorafaxa trial, the TRA, TRA 2P, TB50, which showed that again, compared to orange bar, which is controlled, the treated group with Vorafaxa and aspirin had a, a significant reduction of event. Rate. So we, we actually see the bars, they came down over time with dual antiplatelet. So the question was, can we do better? And in that background, in that background, we started thinking what we should think and should we not think outside the box. Now, we always focus on the platelets. We are looking at platelet, the, 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 the P2Y receptors, the PAR receptors, uh, uh, the cyclooxygen is uh, inhibited by aspirin. But we conveniently forgot that a large part of the system that Professor Wander had shown us uh, how the anticoagulants work the thrombin basically, the activated thrombin has a deep interaction and provides a lot of procoagulant background to the platelets. And the platelets become far more active and interact when there is a high level of thrombin. So the question came in, along with an antiplatelet, if we give a low level of medication that brings down thrombin, are we not uh, actually trying to have a complementary effect? So antithrombotic low dose and an antiplatelet. And that is how that concept of low dose thrombin inhibitor with an antiplatelet, what today is known as dual pathway inhibitor. One pathway is a platelet, another pathway is thrombin. So you have dual pathway inhibition. So dual pathway inhibition, that is what we are talking about. So we've already heard Professor Wander talk in detail about AF-related stroke prevention by rivaroxaban. And we will talk about the other arm, that is vascular protection. But understand that as we were talking about 10, 15, 20 milligrams of rivaroxaban dose, the vascular protective dose, is just a low dose enough to suppress thrombin. Okay, and that is 2.5 milligram twice a day, along with aspirin, 2.5 milligram twice a day. That had been shown to be the best PKPD to suppress low level thrombin at the same time, not increase bleeding. The first trial that, that is often discussed, everybody, many of the listeners might have gone through a, a COMPASS trial, but let us look at the unusual part of the data. This is COMPASS trial that came in October, 2017 that talked about rivaroxaban with and uh, without aspirin in stable cardiovascular disease. Now there's an unusual uh, trial. The entry criteria was coronary artery disease or peripheral arterial disease or CAD with PAD. And if the CAD patient had age of less than 65 to make sure that they are high risk, they needed to have at least two vascular bed disease, polyvascular, polyvascular. And an addition of two risk factors, which means either diabetes, dyslipidemia, or smoking, right? So with that, the study went like this. The study was uh, uh, 27,000 patients, huge data, very strong data, 27,325 patients, stable CAD and PAD, and 1,323 with a primary outcome event. And this trial had three arms. The top, as you see, is Rivaroxaban 2.5, with aspirin 100 milligrams. The middle arm is rivaroxaban 5 milligram BID, and the lower arm is plain aspirin. So aspirin, plain rivaroxaban, and rivaroxaban 2.5 plus aspirin 100. Low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin. And of course, the median follow-up was 23 months, and the primary outcome was MACE, cardiovascular death stroke, and MI, usual. And as we know, the trial was stopped prematurely because the Data Safety Monitoring Board felt that rivaroxaban 2.5 and 100 milligram aspirin was so good that you cannot continue the trial, you have to give everybody rivaroxaban 2.5 and aspirin 100 milligrams. So this is how the results look like. 
the red line you see there is the aspirin alone the blue is river oxaban alone and the red is river oxaban 2.5 bid with aspirin now if we look at the data there we see that there is significant difference between plain aspirin and river oxaban plus aspirin and the hazard ratio is 0.76 so 24% reduction of event rate with a p value of 0.001 significant and this was different between you can see that aspirin and river oxaban plus aspirin there is no difference between aspirin alone and river oxaban alone statistically you can see the p value is 0.12 now that brought about the concept of dual pathway inhibition and showed that our concept that inhibiting platelet alone or inhibiting uh, uh, thrombin alone when we combine both we get a better outcome and that has been clearly shown in the compass data now what about bleeding we know that anything we do extra antiplatelet extra anticoagulant warfarin noax bleeding would increase and obviously bleeding increase major bleeding increase by an hazard ratio 1.7 and the p value is very significant so definitely major bleed increased but the good thing is fatal bleed plus intracranial hemorrhage plus symptomatic bleed in the critical organ so these three are something that can cost our life and something that is very major fatal bleed intracranial hemorrhage symptomatic bleed in critical organs that did not increase and that is good news so minor bleeding okay over time it will subside but fatal bleed intracranial hemorrhage and symptomatic bleed in critical organ com combination there was no increase so the net clinical benefit which means there is slight increase in bleeding and there is benefit of mace right so the net clinical benefit this time we will come to come back to this term because it is very interesting of mace plus fatal bleed plus uh, uh, symptomatic bleed in critical organ we combine all that is there a benefit and we see that there is a benefit with the hazard ratio 0.80 or 20% relative reduction with a p value of 0.001 so over net we get some increase in bleeding which are minor generally we get a net benefit in these cases complementary to that came the river oxaban in peripheral arterial disease study which is called the voyager trial which came just last year again 6500 patients peripheral vascular disease revascularized okay uh, they had aspirin on one side and combination of river oxaban 2.5 plus aspirin just two arms and in that study we again see significantly river oxaban had a 15% relative reduction of what reduction you can see on top one mace cardiovascular death my stroke second male that's a new terminology right acute limb ischemia and amputations so major adverse limb events so male and mace combination was reduced by river oxaban small dose plus aspirin and that is a good news again bleeding we see that bleeding was increased obviously you can see the p value of 0.07 but intracranial or fatal bleeding was not significantly different so anything you do to reduce ischemic event your bleeding will increase but here the major bleeding did not increase and the net benefit was far more than the problems that came along so high risk patients should receive enhanced vascular uh, uh, protection that was the 2019 european guideline so what did they say so first is high risk ischemic events you can see that in red so a second antithrombotic drug should be added to aspirin in patient with high risk thrombotic events ischemic events and of course adding a second uh, antithrombotic to a moderately increased risk of ischemic events high risk is 2a and moderate risk is 2b so they are all all class 2 a and b so what is high risk what is moderate risk high risk is when we have diffuse multi vessel disease of at least one with at least one of the following so multi vessel disease with either diabetes or recurrent mi peripheral artery, arterial disease meaning that there is polyvascular disease and a ckd with a gfr of 15 to 60 okay and moderate risk is any one of the following either a multi vessel disease or diabetes or recurrent mi pad heart failure and ckd so heart failure has come in and multi vessel disease has become just one factor so in high risk you need multi vessel disease with any of those and in moderate risk you can have any one of those so if one of those are there you can consider adding a a, a antithrombotic so if we consider the dual antithrombotic therapy today okay which means we are talking about either dual antiplatelet or a dual pathway inhibition what we talked about 
we have a choice of either we can have clopidogrel 75 plus aspirin or we can have prosugrel 10 mg with aspirin or we can have what we are talking about or ticagrel or 60 mg bd with aspirin or we can have rivaroxaban 2.5 with aspirin especially in post might be on one year or multivessel CAD, and that is the 2019 guideline highlight. In those who have a creatine clearance between 15 and, and 30, these, these, these patients, we should be cautious about bleeding. So the right, what you see is caution. For example, prasugrel should have been used in people who are elderly, people who are thin-built, uh, uh, or people who had got a cerebral hemorrhage. Now, this is new. We were talking about the net clinical benefit with rivaroxaban. Now, this data came, uh, couple of months back, 2020, uh, end uh, uh, July, where they looked into the compass trial data and the net clinical benefit, and it makes very interesting reading. Of course, first they tweaked out all the endpoints and looked at the net clinical benefit, and there was benefit in terms of cardiovascular death, stroke, myocardial infarction, and the bleeding does not increase. What is the bleeding? Symptomatic bleeding into critical organ or fatal bleeding. So even when they took out each, each endpoint separately, they found there was significant benefit with rivaroxaban. That is one, understandable, understandable. But this is something that's a learning point and very, very interesting. Okay, in this graph, you see on the bottom, you have the month timeline. 12 months, 24 months, 30, 30 months, so timeline, right? And the blue ones, all the blue are events. So blue is cardiovascular event, uh, uh, light blue is stroke, and the very light blue is myocardial infarction. And as the bar goes up, there is event reduction. See the heading. These are events prevented. And the red that goes down is positive, means events caused, they are bleeding. So the red ones, as you see, are bleeding. So red one is bleeding bad, blue one is good. Now note the point. Interestingly, as we move from 12 months to 24 months, the benefit, the blue has significantly increased. So reduction of cardiovascular death increased, reduction of stroke increased. Reaction of myocardial infarction, benefit, increase. But the red remains same. Look at 30 months. The benefit is even more, right? The dark blue, cardiovascular death, light blue, stroke, very light blue, myocardial infarction, all have benefited, reduced. But the bleeding remains same. So over time, our combination of dual pathway inhibition with rivaroxaban plus small dose aspirin, unlike other antithrombotics, the graphs tend to widen more and more and we get more benefit and less increase in bleeding. Bleeding is there, no doubt about it, but less increase in bleeding over time. And that understanding is important. The red remains almost same. Now that when translated onto the data, they wanted to see which subgroup benefited most because this is our clinical medicine. Tomorrow morning, you and me, we are clinicians, we'll go to the ward or see a patient and then start thinking, does this patient need addition of small dose rivaroxaban or should he go on the clopidogrel aspirin or the clopidogrel or the ticagrelor aspirin that he continues or simple aspirin that he continues and here is the answer those age less than 65 you look at the graph separation they are bold lines so age less than 65 get the highest benefit not age more than 65 so younger age net clinical benefit is more because bleeding is less and event rate reduction is more right look at that straight red line and the straight blue line. The dotted ones are closer. When you look at vascular bed, polyvascular, this we said already before. So the polyvascular group between dotted lines top and middle, the benefit is largest. GFR, less than 60. The difference is the largest. Look at heart failure, no heart failure. Difference in background of heart failure is larger. And of course, what about diabetes? diabetes presents, difference is the largest. So if you take home anything from this entire uh, discussion and talk, it is this. If I see a patient who has younger age, polyvascular disease, low, slightly lower GFR, presence of heart failure, and diabetes, these are patients who have a high chance of event rate in the next couple of years' time. And these are patients that I might think should I add an antithrombotic with the antiplatelet rather than continuing on a single antiplatelet or a dual antiplatelet? That is important. Uh, finally, the, if you look at 
many people don't understand the therapeutic value. See, we know that uh, uh, agents like rivaroxaban has become so popular in India, quite popular in fact. We see so many prescriptions, but hardly ever we see a vascular dose prescription. We see entire prescription no acts for atrial fibrillation, prevention of DVT, prevention of pulmonary embolism in patients with DVT, or even treatment of pulmonary embolism. But we don't see patients getting vascular dose for prevention of cardiac event rate. So if you look at ACE inhibitors, second column lipid lowering, DAPT in Pegasus, Compass and BP lowering of 10 millimeters, we see that the benefit in Compass is so much, not just that. If you talk about multiple adverse limb events in the presence of a peripheral vascular disease, the benefit in Compass is massive. So Compass stands out by a small dose prevention of cardiovascular events in the long run. Now, this is important. This is where we started. You know, on the left, you have ischemic risk. On the right, you have bleeding risk. So always we want that the ischemic risk should come down and the bleeding risk should also not go up. And where's the sweet spot? Dr. Wander clearly showed you that how the, uh, the, the chat vasc score and the husband score tells us that where is what. And if you actually strike the sweet spot of lowest bleeding and lowest ischemic event, it hits compass, right, of all the trials. And that is why we say it is so important that we remember the compass trial and those who fits in with that data set should tomorrow go home on a small dose of the Roxaban and aspirin. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, where are we? What you see on the right is what Professor Gurdjieff Singh Wander talked about. From embolism, VT, AF, with or without heart failure. DVT, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and TIA prevention, antithrombotic therapy. We had vitamin K antagonists. Antiplatelets are not useful, and we have now migrated on to NOAX, right? But this is an area where we have not progressed. Atherothrombosis, coronary artery disease, peripheral aspirant disease, CVA, myocardial infarction, stroke, TIA, where we have all the lifestyle problems we try to handle. We give medical therapies like lipids, uh, hypertension control, diabetic control, com comorbidities we deal. We talk about single or dual antiplatelets, but there is no place where we think of dual antiplatelets, a, a dual, uh, uh, dual pathway inhibition. So vascular protection by low dose rivaroxaban, which is the dual pathway inhibition. Thrombin on one side and antiplatelet on one side is an emerging concept. Thank you for your time and attention and uh, all three of us are available to answer queries and, and, and discuss and your suggestions. You are mute, Anjanda, you are mute. It was an excellent, exhaustive deliberation. So you have rightly struck the points that it is the vascular component when associated with certain risk factors that gets the maximum benefit with rivaroxaban in a particular dose and combination of aspirin. This is important because of the fact that when Atlas ACS trial with rivaroxaban came up in late, uh, say, 2012 or 13, there was two trials with apexaban, appraise one, appraise two. And they tried to see if the coronary arteries can be taken care of by NOAX along with aspirin or any antiplatelets. But both APEC, APRAISE 1 and 2 are the negative trials. There was increased bleeding and the trials were terminated prematurely. So they looked into, again, the Rivaroxaban because the Atlas SES trial was a successful trial. And finally, it is very interesting to know that when we are talking in terms of ACS, we are using a dose of rivaroxaban or for that matter NOAX. And when we are using or talking or addressing a chronic ischemic heart disease or chronic cardiac syndrome, coronary syndrome as they call it these days, with or without peripheral artery disease or peripheral artery disease alone as a part of probably coronary tree, then the dose is different, the approach is different. So that is something which is very important. You have rightly highlighted and stressed upon these points. Now, probably we can have some questions and discussions, uh, comments or clarifications to seek from the audience. Or if Dr. Abandar likes to make any comment on what uh, Dr. Uh, Tiny talked about. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I would uh, say that uh, it was an excellent talk, uh, which uh, Dr. Tiny Nair has emphasized that dual pathway, um, actually blockage has distinct place we only need to sub-classify uh, our patients and patients who are truly at high risk. And as he beautifully showed, people with multi-vessel disease who have other high risk like mild CKD, 
diabetes, um, those kind of people with heart failure, they are the subset of patients who will benefit maximum with dual pathway. And we certainly, as he uh, actually emphasized, um, we certainly would like to see this dual pathway uh, blockage being used in such kind of patients, but we would not like to see it in patients who are low risk patients because uh, they are uh, not going to get significant benefit. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, if you will pick up and choose the right patients, you will obviously give uh, significant vasculoprotective benefit to your patients. Uh, any question from the chat box? Uh, sir, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Kutte from Raipur is asking, can we use Cetazolone along with Ecosporin 75 plus Ibrox when bad patients? Would you repeat the question yeah, I, again? I, I, I'll read out. I'll read out. He has asked that can we use silostazole, silostazole. Uh, along with aspirin 75 plus rivaroxaban in peripheral vascular disease patients. He has rightly pointed out because there was a time before the advent of NOACs when peripheral artery disease was lingering despite use of aspirin and probably another antiplatelet. Silostazole was a very important uh, alternative to add or addition to add. So, Dr. Kaitaini, your comment on that? Yeah, uh, see, uh, silostazole gives a good relief of, uh, I don't say so good, fair relief of claudication, right? It gives a fair relief of claudication. But there's been no large trial with silostazole showing that it reduces event rate. See, we should try to understand that despite all this talk about nail, uh, um, uh, major, major adverse, major adverse event, event. yeah. What happens to a peripheral vascular disease patient apart from his symptom? He dies of a cardiac disease. So we teach our, our residents that what? If you find there is gross peripheral vascular disease, what are the chances of cardiovascular, coronary vascular disease? 100%. So practically, if you find there is gross POVD, your chance of finding a normal angiogram is almost zero. Right? So they will die of a cardiac event. So your drug should not only reduce uh, claudication, but should prevent a cardiac event. That data is not there with psilocybin. Now, the point is silostazole has a mild antiplatelet effect. So every time you add up silostazole plus rivaroxaban plus your, your NOAC, of course, I mean, your aspirin, you have a slightly higher chance, obviously, of bleeding. Because we had a couple of patients who had bled when they were already on dual antiplatelet plus when we added silostazole. We don't have any trial on these three combinations. Yes. <clears throat> Other questions? Yeah, another question that is there, there I will read out from the chat box. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, oh, dosing. Uh, please do emphasize the indication of dosing of rivaroxaban in COVID-19, especially COVID-associated coagulopathy, and whether it can be used as an alternative to low molecular weight heparin in COVID. If yes, then please throw light. So many different practice exists in this regard. So it's good to have an expert consensus. Thank you. So rivaroxaban in, in COVID. Really, uh, if you look at the COVID, there is no denying the fact that thrombotic event is playing a very important role. It is both aortic as well as pulmonary venous thrombosis. And there was a some trial, some treatment with uh, different types of anticoagulants and antiplatelets. But the consensus as of now is not complete that NOACs are not recommended because of patients taking antiviral drugs and many other drugs which may have a serious drug-to-drug -drug interactions. The, the recommendation as of now is to go for low molecular weight heparin or thrombin inhibitors, like uh, you know the, the other one. And the, the dose should be as of now, enoxaparin 40 milligram OD. But if there is venous or thrombotic occlusions more in venous or arterials, then we can go for BD dose. But as of now, the recommendation is OD. But nothing final has been talked about as of now regarding the addressing the treatment of thromboembolic in COVID-19 background. Your Correct. I, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Anjala Dr. that, you know, there is hardly any large trial available to guide us. And every center and every doctor and every group goes according to their whims and fancies. And we see centers which are writing uh, Eliquis uh, either 2.5 BID or Eliquis 5 BID. We have seen prescriptions for one week, 10 days to three weeks. I've recently seen a prescription for three months of Eliquis. Some uh, centers are exclusively writing Rivaroxaban. Some are writing Dabigat and 110 BD. Because we really don't know. 
but like dr anjanal datta said that is there a thrombotic milieu yes there is a thrombotic milieu but post discharge what is the best we really really don't know but everyone is writing of their own whims and fancies and in a patient who probably has no marker of high level of inflammation in the hospital or no marker that he is likely to go for coagulopathy one should be careful with these agents because you might get a more more of bleeding so i think you have to uh, individually see the patient because what is their risk of covid coagulopathy if there is any indication go ahead and give because these drugs are mostly harmless dr uh, wonder what dr. is wonder like comment? to make any comment uh, i actually agree with both of you what you just said uh, what dr anjan lal datta said that the data is with low molecular weight heparin and uh, actually if you look at it uh, the only couple of things which help in covid is steroids when the saturation oxygen saturation goes below 92% or so and low molecular weight heparin has been shown to be of benefit because the topsy data shows that a lot of these patients had uh, had actually pulmonary thrombo uh, emboli and micro thrombo emboli were there and so the the pulmonary actually disease that these people have does show in a very large subset of patients although pulmonary fibrosis infiltrates are a major component also but a large fraction of them have pulmonary thrombo emboli now low molecular weight heparin has been shown to be of benefit people who have raised d dimers most institutions have a practice that if they are more than four times above you should as dr datta said you should give these people a preventive dose of low molecular weight heparin once a day but if you are documenting actually um, pulmonary thromboemboli then obviously you have to use a therapeutic dose which is twice a day of uh, low molecular weight heparin now the issue is most of these patients will then be discharged and when they are discharged actually that is the time when people are switching over to the noax and um, we don't have any data but i personally actually have no objections to using a noax for a period of 6 weeks in such patients of covid where you have documented pulmonary thromboemboli because you cannot leave them alone you need to put them on a our practice is to give um, oral anticoagulants for a period of 3 months to people who have actually uh, provoked by any yeah so there is no i have absolutely no objection if someone is using actually one of the three um, newer oral anticoagulants in a ct which has documented actually that there are pulmonary thromboemboli but indiscriminate use actually is not going to be just pulmonary infiltrates which are not based <clears throat> upon pulmonary thromboemboli that probably would not be a correct and, all, and also to make sure that there is no drug to drug interactions because newer newer antiviral absolutely. drugs are coming out which may have a drug to drug interaction that is the only point of concern uh, otherwise probably everybody would agree to what your suggestions that uh, since we are learning something new every day with covid 19 so to literally speaking we are learning every day so obviously uh, one comment actually not for this session but i somehow feel very strongly about it dr datta you will permit me to say this uh, i see lot of prescriptions of long term use of steroids in patients of covid and if you look at actually the recovery trial uh, dexamethasone was used for a period of 10 days only and so in, in india somehow i personally feel there is a practice of using very high dosages of steroids for a long period of time but the data only shows actually 6 mg of uh, dexamethasone used for a period of 10 days so i personally actually I, although i am not a covid specialist but being a stickler to evidence base i actually don't feel very comfortable when i see steroids being used in very high dosages and for prolonged period of time there is a logic for using oral anticoagulants for a long period of time because if you have documented actually a pulmonary thromboemboli obviously you will not leave these people and there is a nidus and they can actually they are going to benefit from this i had a discussion with my chest physicians and critical care unit colleagues their uh, uh, advice or their argument is that initially steroid is given as an anti inflammatory drug to take care of the cytokine storm as a part of it and other things but subsequently prolonged continuation is to prevent interstitial lung disease or interstitial lung fibrosis which may result in permanent hypoxic conditions for the patients and it will affect their quality and quantity of life significantly so that was probably one of the reasons they like to continue it for a reasonably or <laughs> not very reasonably long period to make sure that fibrosis is minimized so that ild is minimized but there are also reports uh, you know uh, 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 case reports where people have started steroid early and ended up in very bad results because you know if you 
uh, give steroids at a time there is no inflammation but just viremia the viremia might spread massively infection infection, infection. yes yes now there is another question that is related to our topic that says uh, dr ravindra kumar maheshwari from batinda says that uh, so we should be prescribe rivaroxaban and ecosprin to each and every patient of stable cad pad see the point is the answer is no obviously no the whole point is these uh, drugs uh, rivaroxaban plus uh, uh, aspirin the dual pathway inhibition has been shown to be effective only in people who are high risk what we do defined by high risk a patient who has multi vessel disease multi vessel coronary disease or patient who has multiple events happening or a patient who has got background of heart failure or a patient with polyvascular disease means either a cv in the past now has a cad or a cad and a peripheral vascular disease and of course presence of peripheral vascular disease itself indicate that there is a high risk and with a background of diabetes so if you have any one of these you should individually think that will this patient do better with a combination of over and above aspirin combination of dual pathway inhibition that is one that if you are talking about a patient who has combination of cad and pad these are high risk and probably most of them would be eligible candidates for 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 uh, rivaroxaban in fact they have tried and shown that in the reach registry a large number of patients were actually eligible for for uh, uh, the compass trial eligibility criteria was filled up and probably they had missed out and they should probably be treated with dual pathway inhibition Um, yeah, you are right. You are right, Raini. When you say that we should not use it in all the patients, but at the same time we should make sure that whether you are missing it or not. If a patient has coronary artery disease and objective evidence of peripheral artery disease as well, there is every likelihood have that he has a multiple risk factors which is contributing to these situations. And you know, in Compass trial, there was thirty eight percent diabetic patients, and then you have rightly shown in subset analysis the diabetic patients did. Uh, have a better outcome compared to patients without diabetes so obviously we should look for these risk factors like age now one important factor that has come up recently so far as well talking about the ckd and nox particularly rivaroxaban we know that below 15 it is not not to be used there is no second opinion about that above 30 to 50 well those may be adjusted or modified according to the clinical background of the patients if it is between 15 to 30 the three trials the dvt trial the einstein trial and the patients with the treatment of pulmonary embolism trial there was a good number of the patients who egfr was between 15 to 30 and these patient received rivaroxaban rivaroxaban not with other nox 15 mg and some of the trials are recommending not the guidelines some of the trials are recommending that if you can keep and watch on the renal functions and if the patients need it then you can use rivaroxaban you know get dose modified in gfr between 15 to 30 this is actually way. dr datta question being asked by dr sanjeev kumar khunte and you very beautifully answered this actually so dr khunte from raipur has got the answer there's another question by dr atul roda from kurukshetra in case of fatal hemorrhagic stroke will i be able to escape the medical legal definitely because where you thrombolyze a patient and the hemorrhagic stroke is a known complication yes. but it is the risk benefit ratio actually when you use these agents so have no fear of using actually that is one of the fear why sub optimal anticoagulation absolutely was- absolutely in fact it has come up in the trial as well that sub optimal in, in 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 the in the era of warfarin that whether the sub optimal dose as a equal outcome with the optimal dose or not because people are afraid of using optimal dose because of the fear of hemorrhage and it was clearly shown that both hemorrhagic as well as the thrombotic events are more in the patients who are having suboptimal treatment in fact it is always a trade off between hemorrhage and thrombosis no doubt about it and you have to strike a balance between the two looking at the patients looking at your, at your own experience and everything has to be taken into consideration is one question that is in the chat box is has combination of clopidogrel and rivaroxaban tried in aspirin resistant cases so to wonder do you want to answer that has the combination of clopidogrel and rivaroxaban been tried in aspirin resistant cases i think that has not been tried but yeah. you know uh, the there point is, is if better. you are looking at an e2i12 inhibitor plus a a, a noac the safest combination that has been shown when patients have got post acs and naf is clopidogrel 
plus uh, rivaroxaban that is the probably the i mean uh, uh, for example eliquis that is uh, apixaban plus uh, clopidogrel but you know definitely you can always combine a p2i12 inhibitor with See, one of these uh, tiny we can uh, draw a corollary actually uh, triple therapy uh, patients when we do pci Exactly, you have atrial fibrillation. Absolutely, I was triple, going to. Yeah, triple yeah. therapy has been shown to be of uh, uh, actually increased risk. And what you do there is you use a NOAC with clopidogrel and uh, you aspirin. withdraw aspirin. So to answer Dr. Vishesh Kumar Varmani from Lucknow, yes, there is a experience. Uh, in fact, many trials have now used uh, uh, clopidogrel and uh, rivaroxaban. But the important thing to remember is. do not use the other p2y12 uh, inhibitors which is ticagrelor or prasugrel in combination with the noax so the only uh, p2y12 inhibitor to be used with rivaroxaban or the other noax is clopidogrel yeah three trials have clearly shown it the agastas trial the reduel trial and the pioneer af trial I mean. with apixaban with rivaroxaban with dabigretin that you can use the three together at least for one month or three months depending on which risk is high bleeding or thrombotic is after three months you take off one continue with the two and after one year you continue with noax only in a situation of atrial fibrillation with acs with post pci there is a new guideline of chronic coronary syndrome ccs yes. there they have mentioned as an antiplatelet if the patient cannot tolerate aspirin as a class 1a b you give clopidogrel in these situations yes. so there is a clear mention of that but the, but that is of course not in combination with rivaroxaban that is also between just an antiplatelet any other questions i think one last i can see dr nitish garg jalandhar for chronic stable angina in high risk patients with rivaroxaban which antiplatelet is better aspirin or clopidogrel yes. uh, you know uh, the same has been answered already by uh, professor wonder Uh, we have experience of clopidogrel plus uh, uh, noax in in background of post acs and if but if you are talking about vascular protection what i think you are looking at that chronic stable angina then uh, it is noax plus aspirin nobody has really looked into vascular protection with noax and other p2i12 inhibitors but certainly everybody is looking forward the trial should probably come because the whole scenario is changing as we have seen for example the twilight trial and all that where people have dumped aspirin after a month and gone only with a single uh, ticagrelor so we don't know right you have asked that whether a noac plus a ticagrelor uh, would be beneficial but theoretically chance of bleeding should be more yeah dr wonder uh, uh, and dr tiny na this is very interesting point you raised just limit before say sometime back we used to give to the Uh, dual antiplatelet or triple antiplatelet then take off the clopidogrel or ticagrelor and continue with the aspirins the three new trials the global leader trial the tico trial and the twilight trial complex trial they have done the other way around they are taking off the aspirin and continuing with the ticagrelor for a longer period of time so that is something very interesting we are we are not very much accustomed to using these agents for a long period of time the one thing about the chronic stable angina patient and aspirin and rivaroxaban i just want to know your opinion apart from antiplatelet do you think the aspirin's anti inflammatory action has certain roles here or not in say compass trial or or, or any combination of aspirin with we really don't know because like you said in trials like twilight they have clearly withdrawn aspirin and we have benefited but you know all of these trials at least for the first one month there had been aspirin yeah yeah so but that is in acute if stage if i am looking at uh, uh, inflammation it has to be more in the acute phase right when the event has just occurred so whether at that point of time aspirin's anti inflammatory effect had kicked in we really don't know i think the point dr datta is making is very important for general physicians to re- realize that uh, with the newer actually uh, small strut size stents that we have the endothelialization occurs uh, early and so uh, people have done these large trials especially the twilight trial in which after one month they withdrew aspirin so certainly we don't need to give uh, patients of chronic stable angina when you do a pci uh, you don't need to actually continue dual antiplatelets uh, for a long time and dual antiplatelets depending upon the bleeding risk can easily be withdrawn after 6 months or 3 months but uh, in pa- patients of acs when you are doing then certainly you use dual antiplatelet for a period of one year and then you withdraw okay any other questions
There is one question from yeah. Om Prakash from Mumbai. What was the percentage of patients requiring antidote during rocket AF? Uh, I don't know. Actually, at that time, this Adenex set was not available. Adenex set has become available only recently. And uh, so uh, the point actually about the newer oral anticoagulants is, although the incidence of bleed is uh, there, but it's the GI bleeds which are more with the newer oral anticoagulants. The dreaded intracerebral uh, hemorrhages are less, and not only the intracerebral hemorrhage is less, the uh, incidence of fatal intracerebral hemorrhage is e more significantly less. So one should not be scared in using the newer oral. In fact, they are much, much safer in terms of lesser incidence and lesser fatality. Even when the uh, intracerebral hemorrhages occur, the fatality is less as compared to warfarin-induced uh, ICAs. Yeah, you have rightly pointed out the two important facts that emerge as a reality is that with NOAX, the GI bleed is slightly more than warfarin. And with warfarin, the intracranial bleeding is more then there is no denying the fact. And you have, in your lecture, you have highlighted one particular point, very important, that bioavailability of rivaroxaban improves by about 40% if you take it with food. And taking it with food also prevents from gastritis and gastric irritations. And another third point of NOAX and bleeding is that most of the NOAX action subsides within 24 to 36 hours. So if you can keep the patients uh, otherwise stable, for 24 hours or 30 hours, then you maybe make sure that the effect of NOAX is gone. So that is very important, unlike other drugs, where the efficacy may last for a longer period, so bleeding may continue, but here it lasts only for 24 to 36 hours. That is a very important issue. Yeah, that's uh, a, you've actually pointed out very important thing because uh, when patients have to go for surgery, uh, whereas the oral anticoagulants have to be withdrawn, you have to wait for a period of four to five days, here you have to wait only for 48 hours and your patients can go for surgery because uh, of, the, uh, of the fact that the anticoagulant effect disappears faster. I think somebody has written thanks to all means they want us to stop perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, and, uh, <laughs> there is a comment at the end that uh, the uh, uh, discussion had been very good and elaborate. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Balraj Gupta has thanked all of us. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Thank you. I think we can give back the forum to the organizers. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Once again, a very good evening to you all, respected doctors. It was indeed a treat to listen to our faculties and moderators, sir, on a topic of uh, arteries and clogged. My heartfelt thanks to Dr. Anjanlal Datta, sir, for sparing his time and accepting our invitation to moderate today's webinar. Thank you very much, sir. My heartfelt thanks to both the respected speaker faculties today. Dr. Gurpreet Wander, sir, and Dr. Tiny Nair, sir, for a wonderful deliberation as usual on a topic of everybody's interest. Thank you, sir. And finally, I thank you all viewers from all across the country on behalf of IPCA for attending this meeting on the Saturday evening. Thank you. Stay safe. Take care. <laughs>